Oh, so it's that that's called from two years ago. So that goal is you can fix 50 years of neglect in just two years with this administration. So that's the first year of the Biden administration. Um, it's in one perspective that 50 years of neglect obviously spans a lot of different um, there are ways of neglecting the game and not funny in the neglected ways. So we talked about mitigations. This is a term that we're all going to come to know and love. Um, uh, mitigation is any practice that can reduce the offering of the pesticides. So that spans from soil health practices to other conservation practices to things like specifying the roadsides on labels. All of those are mitigations. Um, and mitigation show up on labels in, in one of two ways. So, and this is as of like right now this year. So mitigation is needed everywhere that pesticide might be used, so the entire United States. It's going to show up on the general label. So the, those are things like weather statements that apply to saturated soil, don't apply within 48 hours before rainfall, droplet size distribution, wind speed. If there are mitigations that are just needed in specific areas, perhaps close to the endangered species habitat, <laughs> then they'll be showing up in bulletin slide two, which Chris is going to talk to you about. And this is the fun new online system that EPA is providing for people to learn about these more specific geographically specific mitigations. These um, have an overlap with other managed practices to reduce erosion and reduce nutrient loading and things like that. So we learned about the whole process, right? We learned about the legislation. We learned about how mitigation are developed. Let's go on to the next slide and we'll see how it's going in practice. Which makes me think just one step this way. That's fine. Perfect. It's the X on the floor. <laughs> Do not move. Um, so we need to get sued a lot. So starting about 2001, they were sued by Washington Toxics Coalition, Washington, Washington Toxics Coalition, they were sued in Washington by a Washington group. Um, for not enforcing the Endangered Species Act, not following the requirements of the Endangered Species Act. What that led to in 2002 was that the court vacated the registration of 54 pesticides and added mandatory no spray buffers around endangered species habitat. At this time, it was the habitat. The buffers were 20 yards for ground applications and 100 yards for aerial applications. So depending on where you are in Washington, that can take a big bite out of your field. We'll go back to one. That, <laughs> as of 2004, EPA had gone through their risk assessment and effects determination process for all of those pesticides. And they had begun consultation with the National Marine Fishery Service for 37 of them. And so that settlement, they settled that lawsuit, they were doing their job, we're good to go, right? Now we can go on. So that lawsuit and those mandatory industry bubbles were part of the origin of violence. So the objective there was to look at where, what is going there, what pesticides are being applied to it, and what the eventual fate of those pesticides might be. So this is a quote from EPA's work plan, and this is what we're trying to um, kind of provide some real world information for. When usage data, pesticide usage data, are unavailable or inadequate, EPA typically makes conservative assumptions. For example, that 100% of treatable use sites will actually be treated at the maximum labor rate. We, we don't think that that's necessarily what happens every time. But that's EPA's standard assumption when they're doing risk assessments. So part of why NRS came to be was to collect some of this real world information that EPA could use in doing those risk assessments. So we can go through a couple of the things. You've already seen them in the next slide. We have our surface water monitoring program. Uh, Leslie was talking about Abby's work. We collect samples throughout the state 
During the prime season, 15 to 17 sites, maybe 150 different pesticides. We analyze them, publish the results of fact sheets. I have some fact sheets with me in case anyone is interested in see what they look like. Ryan at the Blue CD has been collecting samples for us for four years. So you can add some sites that we weren't able to reach before. So now we have samples um, all across the state from different regions. And go ahead. This is our Ag Land Use Mapping Program. Uh, Leslie mentioned I should have switched places with her. Um, Joel Benry runs the program. We map all the counties of the state in the three year rotation to know where their crops are growing. And um, you can map, you stay here because I didn't give Chris a slide because we didn't have any website clip to show for him. Chris does the pesticide usage data collection, which is the objective to see sort of what those applications actually look like in terms of. Is it the next level rate or not the next level rate? So he collects anonymous usage data from growers. That is, um, I don't know, combined. So it's not from individual growers and in groups and sort of collate all the data into one sort of number that everyone agrees on. So that sounds great, right? We're collecting all of this data. We're sharing it with EPA. They have real world information. They settled their lawsuit. They started the consultation process. We're good to go. Uh, we're not, as it turns out, we're not good to go. So in 2011, this is California now. In 2011, the Center for Biological Diversity sued EPA for not publishing the Endangered Species Act requirements to join their pesticide registration process. This is for 382 active ingredients instead of 54. That's why this suit becomes known as the mega suit. In 2014, we got court ordered mandatory no spray buffers. This time it was only for nine pesticides. But this time, it was not until EPA finished their effects determination. It was until the mitigation requirements from the National Marine Fisheries Service were in place and required by EPA. So the sort of target has moved on now, not just to EPA starting the process, but to the actual conditions being required. So uh, that lawsuit was settled in 2022 and 2023. And um, part of it was that EPA agreed to a schedule to review 18 different active ingredients. And they also agreed to develop a work plan that would describe how they were going to successfully follow the Endangered Species Act requirements in the future, given that they can review 1,200 active ingredients every 15 years and successfully consult with the National Marine Fisheries Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And maybe you were wondering, how come only EPA gets sued? It's not the case. The National Marine Fisheries Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service also get sued. So yeah, go ahead. This is a picture of the work plan. It's nice, nice. They got like little honeybee looking honeycomb things because they were little pollinators to protect them from the pesticide. It's nice and yellow. It's like spring, spring colors. Um, so I just, in case anyone is thinking that this has solved EPA's getting sued problem, um, Part of this work plan describes EPA's herbicide strategy. And that herbicide strategy was supposed to be final and in place spring 2024. And I will maybe cut to the chase and say that it is not final. It is not in place. And I'm assuming that the courts won't, won't like that. I, I can't say for sure. I don't think it's going to go over well. So here, we're going to pause. It's really exciting stuff. And um, we'll give you some polls. Do you want some well, part of what we want to do is just collect some information about if people know about this. Like my my take has been that a lot of the time we talk to people and they aren't aware of it because it's going on. So you have a link a little piece of paper that has our QR code on it. You can go to the first poll and just answer some information. And then if you're tired of polling and sitting down, you can come and do a map activity, physical activity, you can walk around. We've got stickers. We're going to talk about where we think those mitigations might be turning up 
those geographically specific mitigations that are intended to protect endangered species habitats. You can, if you get something, you can put a sticker on that. You can keep a little glitter star sticker if you want. I don't know where to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can have candy too. If you come put a sticker on the map, it'll give you a piece of someone else's candy. <laughs> because we work for the state. <laughs> so you have those resources. Yeah. No, but I was supposed to stay in one place. Is that the actual AC or the fan? I'm wearing a sweater. It's not that easy. I mean, it feels like it just went back up. For the mitigation, no, I'm going to try. Yeah, there is a to join on this <laughs> so I can actually see if I can see it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so much. So great. So I just said you got to be on the owl for both. Uh, yeah. Okay. Which is funny. It's the...
panel. Um, as previously introduced, I'm Chris Nocella, WSDA. The next slide. Yeah. So these mitigation areas, I'm going to introduce one of our favorite things in government acronyms. Oh, no, you're right. PULA, Pesticide Use Limitation Area. Um, so basically, that's where we're trying to get you to go. And this is the acres by county um, for who has them. And there are only five counties that don't have them. And they are all the ones in the northeast corner of the state. Um, Chief Joseph Dam stops salmon from swimming upstream. So that's kind of your big hint as to where people are located. Um, but with this also, um, we're going to make a pitch for you later. So you know, if you see your kind of out here, you're like, damn, we've got a lot of acres in there. Come talk to us as well afterwards. Although I will make an important caveat, um, like Grace Harbor, Pacific counties, those some of the ones on the west, west by like uh, the ocean, they are counting like your oyster beds and those sorts of things as well. So just keep it in mind. Yep, yep, yep. So this is the map of the pools we have here. So it predominantly correlates with salmon habitat, except for one little spot in southwestern Washington. There's a butterfly there that I'm kind of worried about as well. Um, next one. So uh, that arrow is approximately where Leavenworth is. And if any of you wanted to be super cool, you would have just went like this. <laughs> next slide. Because I think by my eyeball, we are currently in a pool. So if you kind of feel that like oppression of, man, I want to apply pesticides, but I'm not sure, that's why. So you didn't even know it. You didn't even know it. So thank you to the organizers for doing that. Yeah, next slide. So um, kind of bringing it back to that EPA's work plan, they laid out a roadmap, more or less, of what they said they were going to do to try and make things better for endangered species, but also making sure people can still apply pesticides. So this is going to be a long slide. So <laughs> on the left, we have bulletin slide two and registration review. Those are the two things on this slide that we know have good concrete ideas of what's happening because they are active and live. So in bulletin slide two, we have mitigations here in Washington currently for eight pesticides, I believe. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is a very important thing because this is where people will go to see the mitigations they may or may not need to be doing. So as Margaret already kind of mentioned as well, there's the registration review. Pesticides get reviewed every 15 years or so. Um, with this process, they kind of shuffle the deck a little bit to try and get some of the more popular things sooner rather than later. So some of the ones we'll see coming up for review, Mango said is a pretty widely used um, fungicide. Then we have 2,4-D, aminoclobrid, and atrazine. Um, herbicide, insecticide, herbicide again. Um, but this, this is the start of the review process, and they'll issue proposed interim decisions, which basically will kind of give us an idea of what they're thinking, if they want to do mitigations, and if they want to send it to the services for further consultation. So it's kind of like, all right, we'll have an idea, and then we'll initiate that process. So then on the right, I have the vulnerable species pilot, and the pesticide strategies, the vulnerable species pilot. Um, maybe some of you, if you're in like Skagit County, have heard of this. It caused a lot of heartburn for a lot of people in that area. Um, they're trying to protect endangered species right away, the ones they thought were threatened by pesticides. In Washington, we had two, or have two, Taylor's Checker Spot and the White Wild Splatter Pod. Um, we'll start from the bottom. The White Wild Splatter Pod is just in one little spot. Um, on the opposite side of the Columbia River from Hanford Reach. Um, not, not very impactful on agriculture. There's a few people who might be affected, but not many. Taylor's checker spot, they kind of use some old range maps and were applying these um, no spray zones, and that caused a lot of um, heartburn and angst amongst people. And some very strong comment letters were written, and the EKs kind of walked that one back. And then we have the pesticide strategies. These are originally intended to be their ideas of. We're going to issue things so we can continue to use the pesticides we have to protect them from further lawsuits so that way we can go through our regular registration review process. So as Margaret already said, their side strategy will be finalized this year, 
we get our draft of the insecticide and rodenticide um, strategies this year as well. We'll see the final versions maybe next year. And then the fungicide one, they still have time to settle that timeline through the core process. So next one. BLT, the very fun acronym. Um, we have the sandwich, bacon, lettuce, tomato, and then bullets and like too. So there's BLT and BLT. So um, unfortunately, the one with the exclamation point is less fun. But they make for a good comparison. Um, both things are very horrible. Uh, they're easily adapted from the original recipe. I'm a millennial. Give me an avocado, slap it right on that BLT. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, for both of that too, it's a much easier way for them to amend the labels versus printing out like a textbook to put on the label. Um, but that's kind of where the comparison ends. Um, BLT, very simple. You don't even need bread. You just need bacon, lettuce, tomato. It's just deconstructed. Bolson's Lab 2 can be incredibly complex, as I will show you. Um, BLT's sandwich do not require an internet connection. Bolson's Lab 2 does, and that's something that's been brought up repeatedly to the EPA for people in very rural areas who don't always have access to the internet. Bacon, lettuce, tomato, you feel good, you feel whole. Bolton's Lab 2, you feel kind of confused after it. So, <laughs> next one. So that's, that's the end of my stand-up routine. Um, so this is the landing page for Bolton's Lab 2, just to kind of orientate you, like, oh, if I want to go here, this is what you're looking for. Um, just a quick overview of it. Um, kind of things that were mentioned, it's used to, it used to issue additional use requirements. Um, it allows them to make very geographically specific areas for some of those mitigations. If you look very closely at this map, it's up by Linden in the northwest part of the state. Um, the EPA is very powerful, so powerful in fact, Canada has to follow. Um, <laughs> and then it's also considered an extension of the pesticide label, so if you're directed to do so by the label, you must go to Bolton's Lab 2 to see if you need to get mitigation or not. Next one. So pesticides with Kulas in Washington, I would say I'm sorry, but the world I swim in, we deal with pesticides by the AI names, and there's just too many common names to list here. But we have a couple herbicides, Chromation, Metacor, Bromoxanil, and then a bunch of insecticides, now fine as Nyncopirifos, and Trinoco. And I haven't been quite sure if one through D is a fungicide or an herbicide. I've never really read that one's label, sorry. But for the one with stars, they coincide with that salmon habitat and again, cyanotrinoprol. It's more about a butterfly in southwestern Washington. Okay. So some of the things you might see when you're in Bulletin's Lab 2, um, for Washington in particular, we have that do not apply to saturated soils or runoff producing rains coming. That's kind of like in my mind common sense unless, you know, you're applying one of those water-activated pre-emergence herbicides, then you should probably do that. But that's not what that mitigation is for. Um, air, uh, buffers for aerial applications, and then if you're going to go above a certain application rate, they say do one of these things just to help minimize the movement of that pesticide towards the water, and then also kind of limiting some options on tank mixes. Um, and quite frankly, I don't think you should be mixing some of the things they list there anyway. But we looked at other states to see that some of the examples of things that might happen as well. Probably the one that's the biggest is within that pool that you cannot apply that pesticide. Um, other things like you can only apply at night with a buffer requirement. Other things are kind of more habitat related, like not near lupin or when the wind is blowing towards the critical habitat. So you can kind of see like some of these things will require some interpretation and knowledge of like what's a lupin look like? What's critical habitat? So um, there'll just be a lot of education outreach that needs to be done to help interpret some things. So how do we know if you need to implement mitigations? Read the label. But truly, that like, if you have a question, check the label first and then start Googling, Googling things because hopefully the label will be able to get you to where you need to be. Next slide. On the label, now we're starting to see them show up. Um, it's endangered species language. That will direct you to go not to Bulletin's Lab 2 directly, but to this other website that's three clicks away from Bulletin's Lab 2, but they want you to help drive traffic to the UK's website. I don't know. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> so I would say, truthfully, 
just Google bulletins I have two, and um, that'll take you there. And then my asterisk there is, you know, one thing we've heard from compliance is right now it seems like the label, if you look this up, or what they're saying is follow the label that came in with the container. If that's what was on your label when you bought it, then follow that label because if you've lost that label, you go look it up online, you might get a newer label then that has those mitigations. Compliance says just keep it easy, do what's on the container. So next one now for real. <laughs> so um, Google Bulletins Lab 2, uh, kind of another fun activity. If you all are want to do it, pull out your phones and try and go to Bulletins Lab 2, just do Google right now. Um, I did it this morning, so my presentation's wrong already. Next slide. It used to be very kind of like iffy if you got there. I used to always get this error, but I would just close that and it would still work. Now, um, I checked it just before this. It wants me to open a new tab and it says you can use it now. So for a long time, it didn't work on mobile devices, but now they're slowly figuring that out. So kind of borrowed from Grant earlier patience is necessary with the federal government. Next. So um, on the Bulletin's Lab 2 website, uh, you're going to want to enter some information, otherwise it'll take you too long. Next slide, please. And those three pieces of the information, um, when you're going to make the application so you can think of that six months ahead of time. So we're in June now. You can get this information for an application all the way up to December where you're gonna make it, and then the registration number of the pesticide. If you have a look for the registration number, it's usually listed around the active ingredient. That's a very helpful thing for this, um, but also just don't confuse it for the establishment number. There are two numbers there, so make sure you're getting the registration number. Next one. So, and then from the bottom up, this is what I say, because once you put that registration number in, you select the pesticide you're using, and that filters them all out and speeds this cost up process out a lot. So then enter your registration number, application month, and where you are. You can enter a zip code, GPS coordinates, town, or you can just do the click on a map. Next one. So we're going to pretend like we were applying some diazinon here at Leavenworth. And next slide. Um, well, you know, we have a pesticide use limitation area, Pula, here around Leavenworth, because we're in one. Um, so we click get the bulletin. And again, the bulletin is an extension of the label, so you need to follow it. Not following the limitations listed is an enforceable action. And so your first page of your bulletin is just showing you a map of the Pula, and there's no real good way to delineate where you are making the application, but um, I would assume if you ever had to present it, you could just say, this is us here. But um, compliance is taking their time because they want to see everything finalized before they really get out there with words, but these are kind of like things they're starting to say now about it. So just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so page two, um, it'll just list the products for your, your product, the AI, how it's applied, the uses of it, the form of the, the product you're using, and then importantly, it'll list the mitigation codes. Some of them can be quite lengthy, so there are a lot of codes. In this instance, we only have two. Um, Code here is one about not applying it before it's going to rain, or if the soil is wet, it also says don't apply it if it's windy. Some common sense usage things, I would say. However, next slide. The other mitigation code is a block of text that's going to hit you over the head. So um, I'm going to talk about it, I hope you can read through it by the time it gets to the bottom, because I know what it says, but I hope you can figure it out. Um, they're not going to format it. And then the most fun part about it is they're gonna make you go to a website at the very bottom. Next one. So at the very bottom, you have to go to a website after you've deciphered everything. And what it was saying up before that was the use rates and how deep you were soil incorporating is gonna determine the number of mitigation points you need to have. And then with this um, little blowout box here, there's one more important piece of information you need to remember from it. And that is you're going through runoff mitigation points because the website it takes you to brings you to this mitigation menu. Wow. And if you don't pay attention to like, I forgot already, drift or runoff, you might be doing drift reduction when you need to do runoff reduction, vice versa. Um, so the range for this one was 15 to 80 points. Um, also those are meters for filter strips and 20 meters is probably a pretty big chunk of anybody's field. 
And that's probably, well, aside from spot applications that are less than one acre, I don't think weed it's are that good yet, but um, there's just a, a lot of challenges for getting a lot of people to where they need to be with applications. So I'd say at the moment, we're kind of lucky with this one, it's an organophosphate. It's kind of older, doesn't use too terribly much, but I know they really like an apple still. So um, it's just to show the kinds of things that we see coming, and this is already active. So once people start getting new labels for diazma, if they're in one of these areas, they might have to do these sorts of things. So just things to be aware of. So this is bringing us back to here, transition out of what we know is happening, what we've seen happening to kind of what might happen. Yeah. So I'm gonna talk about the herbicide strategy mostly here, and until it's finalized, things can change and they probably will change. I've given this talk on the herbicide strategy too many times and then two weeks later, it was wrong. So take it more like as a guide as the things we're seeing and we think will happen. So next slide. So again, herbicide strategy we finalized in August of uh, this, sorry, 2024. <laughs> Whoops, oh well. Um, with the draft of the herbicide strategy, it was kind of like, the sky has fallen because they were going to implement mitigations just about immediately after they finalize and say, okay, things will start hitting labels. People will need to start doing this in real short order. And in Washington, we weren't going to get spared much. We were in, most of the agriculture here is in P101 or three. It pretty much covered the entire state. And with that, people were going to have to use buffers and then work from the mitigations list to make the point value of the herbicide they were applying. So it was gonna be just a seismic change. Next slide. But, you know, comment period opened up and the EPA just received tons of comments. And when I say tons of comments, that's 250. There were 18,000, but those are all like a write-in letter, but 250 is still a pretty big number for this. And they kind of got the message. And then this April issued, uh, an update on what they were thinking. So now the biggest update for this is they're no longer going to immediately implement any of these mitigations for herbicides, but rather it's now the regulatory framework for how they're going to review things when these herbicides come up for review. So we assume that's going to be true for rodenticides, fungicides, and insecticides as well. And then also with this too, I think they're kind of showing us they're willing to be a partner and listen to what the states and ag organizations have to say about the things that they're trying to do because we saw them change a lot of things as well. One of the things that I think was, yep, 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 yep. yeah, this is, this is right. <laughs> one of the things I think was the most fun was for one of the mitigations, you just got plus one for being Western agriculture. So anybody inside that area, you would have got plus one point. And I think the, like, to me, one of the best parts was in Washington, the line was 385. And you just drive them down up by Ritzville, it's like the left side of the road versus the right side of the road. You just kind of like shake your head. It's like, I get you needed a line, but really? <laughs> but through their feedback and updates of the process, next one, this is what they really meant to say is nope. we want people to have, you know, like know they're in a low runoff vulnerability area so they can just, you know, they won't have to do as much. So that's what they were trying to say. And it kind of just took a lot of feedback for them to go, okay, yeah, this is what we wanted to do. So next slide. Mm -hmm. But still, um, just the heads up with it is buffers and mitigations will still be required. It's just they're going to be implemented likely later through the registration review process now. So, and they'll still be coolers and general labels. So I guess the take home point is the general label or uh, no, backwards. The PULA is generally more restrictive than the general label. So if you look at the buffers here for 2,4-D, um, as you go up and down in the, um, the application rate, you can see how the buffer sizes change, or depending on the cropping system, the number of mitigation points you may or may not need for those things. Yep. So I keep saying mitigation points. So what do you do to get mitigation points? They have um, mitigation practices. So these first things, aren't really things farmers can do per se. Um, field level characteristics, that's kind of just like the luck of geography. So you have that county level erosion risk map, people with sandy soil, they get lucky and get another 
you know, like another check for good mitigations and then flat fields as well. So I had joked you'll just see the blue flattened out to look like Iowa, but that's a lot of tillage. Um, the kind of the one thing people can do right away with their applications is like kind of tweak it, reduce the rate, reduce the amount of area, or if it's um, soil incorporate herbicides, if it's not required by the label, those all kind of count. And then there's exemptions where you don't have to follow mitigation. So if you're far enough away from critical habitat, you have subsurface drainage that enter, empties into a retention system or across a buffer. And then lastly, participation in a conservation program, which is something the EPA has kind of said, bring forth your best um, ideas of it because we're not going to give you any guidance. So Margaret's actually leading that um, charge right now with Washington, Oregon, and some of the federal partners. And they're, yeah, it's just one of those things where like, we're going to put forth our best effort. So next one. Finally, here it is. Mitigations. The things the EPA is saying they're looking for people to do things you might be familiar with. Um, honestly, I would say think about them as conservation practices that limit erosion, help water infiltrate into the soil, and slow down the wind. Um, I'm not going to go through them all just because I think they're kind of evident to you all. And yeah, so I think with that, we move on to the next poll. Yeah. take this poll here or you're showing around um they're gonna say i don't really but they're gonna say live until i decide to do that really because they're attached to my microsoft 365 account that's right yeah um so we can go on to the next slide i just realized that i didn't think that's too oh. government records <laughs> um so what is this? What is this sort of? What are we thinking about with regards to this? We had talked about our three programs to try to provide accurate information to EPA, surface water monitoring, agricultural land use mapping, and pesticide usage data collection. That didn't help really. 
may have helped because we have good information, but you guys still get sued and we still get this kind of back and forth of lawsuits and courts reversing things and orders kind of courts. And um, so we're gonna, what we have been doing is developing pesticide stewardship program, um, which, you know, everyone is really excited about stewardship. You say this, it's a really similar characteristics of voluntary stewardship program and I talked to Leslie a lot about what the work that they're doing and how it works. And so you can go on to the next slide. Um, so this is one of the kind of structures or part of what we're really chasing is information, right? So like Chris is talking about bulletin slide two and how you use it and when do you know if you need to use it and what pesticides have bulletins in Washington. This is information that farmers need to have if they're going to correctly apply the pesticides. EPA needs to know what's happening. EPA needs to know if the mitigations they're requiring are possible or not possible in different places. They need to know if their polygon for Western agriculture is dumb or not dumb, right? This is just the kind of information that that they need to have. This is an example. Um, this is the original in the vulnerable species pilot that Chris mentioned. This um, picture with the purple overlapping circles. This is from the Fish and Wildlife Service recovery range map for the Taylor Cheddar Spot Butterfly. And you can see that it covers like a big chunk of Western Washington agriculture in Skagit County. And this was originally in their first planning, pesticide use avoidance area, which meant no outdoor pesticide use in that entire preparation. Now, obviously, you can get a lot of comments about that, <laughs> including from us and lots of other people as well. And so now they've mapped it to this uh, bottom picture with the green area. So they worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service to improve where that mitigation of avoiding using pesticides was actually required. So this is information that EPA needs to have. Um, next slide. So this is where we're looking for participation, right? To help us in gathering information. EPA is still, they still figuring this out. Like Chris mentioned, that they have sort of thrown out this idea of conservation programs in other documents, the National Marine Fishery Service actually called it pesticide stewardship partnership programs. I think they're calling out Oregon's program, um, which is named pesticide stewardship partnerships. Um, so they're still thinking about this stuff. I meet with them now, I meet with them now every other week to talk about this stuff. And so what we can do now is get more feedback and bring more ideas and more information to them because they are interested in learning how the impact of these things will affect people in Washington, affect farmers in Washington. Um, and what information you can take to them is what are the most urgent needs in Washington? When you look at the mitigations that will be required, how are they going to affect people in different parts of the state? Because they're going to affect people in different parts of the state differently, depending on what crops they grow and what the environment is like there and the ecosystems and what species they're near and what habitat they're near. So then where should the data take it in? Right, we've had some success working on this. Um, WST is fitting in other programs and providing support and coordinating with conservation districts and other local organizations. And so we would need to know where we fit in in this process and what we can do is we're talking and giving comments to EPA and wanting to work with conservation districts. We were working with Brian and the Conservation District to do monitoring and he's been listening to us kind of just talk wildly about what pesticide stewardship should look like. And so that's information that we need from all kinds of people. I don't, we don't have a lot of money to work on this. But we're interested in, in just learning more about what, what a good role for us would be. Um, and so this is, you can go to the next slide, this is sort of my down first idea, right? So this is a, an example that we did a cooperation where we co we, um, huh? I'm familiar with it, that's all. Yes. <laughs> We're famous. Um, so this was in response to the mandatory no spray buffer rule in 2014. We were talking with growers in Walker County, blueberry growers in Walker County who were going to be 
seriously affected by a 100 yard no spray buffer for aerial applications. Those growers were at, at that time and still currently trying to uh, deal with spotted neighbor sawmill, an invasive pest, <laughs> causing a lot of damage to blueberries. Um, and they were making regular aerial applications in all time. And so we were talking with the National Marine Fishery Service at that time about riparian hydros and how beneficial they could be to intercepting direct from their pesticide applications. And we were able to get cooperation from farmers who let us come on their fields and install equipment. We collected samples before and after aerial applications at Mount Lion. We published a paper on it. And now riparian hydros are one of the National Marine Fishery Service's approved mitigations. And this paper is cited in that document, and it's cited by EPA as part of the reason why this mitigation is part of the toolkit. So, like initially, I was like, great, we just do lots of different studies. We'll get all these new mitigations accepted, everything will be fine, and we'll all look happy ever after. Except, of course, that's not how it works because in this region, this was a useful thing to do. But in other regions, that's not necessarily a useful thing to do. Not even necessarily the same, but as you feel studies and mitigation, so in different regions, we're going to need different activities. And so that's part of what we have to figure out is, is are there regions where the state can help figure things out? The EPA needs local information and local resources to figure out different solutions for different places. Um, yeah. I have just one note because the thing we don't want, right? You guys can keep getting sued fairly over and over again. And one of the things that we would like to avoid is having things sort of reversed over and over in unpredictable ways by the court system. Because that really leaves farmers not knowing what's going on or what they should do. Because if they think that the pesticide that they're using this year is going to be canceled next year, there's not a lot of incentive for them to implement a mitigation that might help them meet the number of points. It might get canceled anyway next year. And so I wanted to mention this was related to human health, but this was a sort of a recent, <laughs> a recent court case. Um, I read these things. So nobody else has to suffer. Um, but this is related to human health concerns in August 2021. The court ordered EPA to issue a rule on clopyrifos. And they did. They canceled all food tolerances for clopyrifos, effectively making the pesticide unusable in Washington and everywhere else in the United States. In November 2023, the court vacated that rule, saying it was arbitrary and capricious. So now you can use clopyrifos again. In February 2024, the EPA had chosen a new rule consisting of that court order, so you can still use Corpiravas for now, again, but for how long? Right, so this is the thing that's really problematic, and so that's what we're hoping to avoid, is um, this kind of back and forth situation. And we will let like, people just know what's going on, because then they're going to be interested in making the investment in mitigations, which you cannot overlap with conservation practices. And then that will help farmers because they have predictability, they're keeping their pesticides on target, they're all the native species because the pesticides will stay on target and not reach them. So that is our ask for information and helping friends in the right direction and do the polls <laughs> and contact us if you want to talk more. Um, and if you put your email address in to the poll, then we will send you some updates as soon as we have some updates. Um, but especially about things like conservation programs. Well, I was yeah. going to say, also, if you really enjoyed that bulletin slide two stuff as oh, well, right. you know, if this was the light version, I can talk for about for, for about an hour. So if you really, <laughs> yes. really liked it. And we can do it for credits, too. If you yeah. want to offer credits to your growers in your region, you can come and do that talk for credits. Um, so yes. I guess that leads me to wondering how, what the curriculum kind of looks like for the licensing test now as it relates to this. Like, is it, are there different certifications that 
where all the certifications have to uh, maybe learn about this? Or is this? That's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I have a great answer to you. Um, it's hard to say. The closest I would answer is just saying it's like, do I have sure the question for all my folks? It should be good. Okay, yeah. we also. So the question was, what's like SSI certifications would need to Yeah, licenses, I guess. Yes. Yeah. I would assume all of them because this is just going to be on the label. So if they're using it and it's on the label, it doesn't really matter. If you're going to buy the product, you need to follow it. Yeah, and they're, they're, I'm sure they're teaching that now, but I guess. I, I, the people who do the SSI classes, it's part of the. So, yeah, have no strong answer for it other than, yeah. yes. This is still such a moving target. Yeah. That, and one of the challenges that we are hearing from the non, non regulatory people, the non regulatory people, but what we're hearing from the regulatory people is that EPA hasn't given them any information about how to enforce on these things, um, what kind, you know. What kinds of enforcement actions and how all of that, like, like that bulletin language that Chris showed you, that's kind of just block of text about, you know, how is the farmer going to parse that or like, or if the same thing is true on our end for like what, what elements of that are enforceable and how is that going to work when we, you know, are trying to go out and inspect, like if you're going out to inspect someone's filter strip. What does that look like? That's not an activity that we've previously engaged in from what I understand. And so that's just a whole different can of worms. And so one of the things that is happening right now is that we are looking for information on the regulatory and the EPA as well. So we know what we have to do and how the education materials have to change. Um, so that's uh, probably still a lot of the More questions? Yeah. Uh, I think you briefly went over it, but if a producer has an old label, so it doesn't tell them to go to the EPA website and do all that stuff yet, do they still need to go to the bulletin live to enter things? Or do they just, like if the label doesn't tell them to go to the website and all that, they just do what the label says? And if a producer has a usable label, like not an expired, but a usable pesticide in the original label, the label was live, all the requirements on that label that came with the pesticide. So if they purchase a new container pesticide that has a new label that says go to bulletin slide two, the label is off. So they have to go to bulletin slide two and that will be information. Um, so it's just there's gonna be some time period where people are working with product from the previous year that doesn't have that requirement, and then someone else is gonna have product from this year that does have that requirement, it's gonna increase the confusion a lot. Um, but that is what we have been told. Do you want any complaints? Yeah. So if we find one bulletin slide that we're within a pool of, is that no spray only for the chemicals listed or no spray of anything? And that's a great question. So I think there, this is part of, I'm sorry. It's because there's like these simultaneous classes that's happening. So there's Things entering bulletin slide two, and they'll say exactly like what you have to do. So they'll say, um, you know, if you're within 300 yards of habitat that looks like this, then you have to either use a 100 yard no spray bottle or have a riparian hedgerow or so it'll be something like that. And then there's these other strategies like the vulnerable species pilot, which was intended to protect. Most vulnerable species before EPA got through their registration review process. And that involved pesticide use of winds areas, which were these larger, like no spray zones. And right now, those are on hold until EPA is going to get sued. Yeah, right. So, if there is a no spray zone, do they have any recommendations or any holds for noxious weeds? Huh? Is it? <laughs> that is so we come so we and I have people uh, made that comment <laughs> when we put the comments on the vulnerable species pilot that you know there's lots of reasons why we need to be able to supply pesticides. In fact, sometimes pesticide applications can help endangered species by preserving habitat. 
They got included in the first iteration of the vulnerable species pilot, a loophole, which was go to your local fish and wildlife service office and ask them. <laughs> My understanding is that this was not well received by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Because um, there again, there was no procedure. Like, how do they approve? You know, saying is everyone who wants to use that pesticide going to turn up? And like, can I use some cyanide local, please? And so that that perhaps there will be a loophole when that reaches prime time, but I I don't. It's hard to say. I mean, I was going to say, like for now, the herbicides are pretty limited, so maybe it will still be okay for a while, but as I keep reviewing things, it might get a little nicer, but it all does just depend on like, what they decide for mitigations. And the other thing to know, this was the BLT light talk, again, we can do this for hours. Um, the Pula is, I don't know, right, 300 feet or yards? Meters. Meters. Um, the pool is big just to get people to realize they're in the area, but a lot of times the mitigations are much smaller. So even if you're in a pool, like you might not have to follow any mitigations, and like that might be one of those instances, like in Washington, where the pool is along sand streams or something, but it's like only oh, for like 15 feet versus the entirety of the pool. So, but it is all just kind of like up in the air. One of those things that I guess we'll find out. <laughs> so. More questions? Are we going to talk about the litigation more? <laughs> you do? Yes. <laughs> Any questions from online? Uh, not right. So, yeah, no questions from the chat? I guess I have one more. Go. I have a litigation. So, are they suing for money? Where did that money go? Mostly, they're suing for changing those. So, um, and I, I, I really could talk about this for a long time. <laughs> um, but so, initially, from the beginning, that's what doesn't want to do. What they wanted EPA the to do was follow the Endangered Species Act. And so, that was the original intent. And so, then they got that settlement agreement that EPA would correctly review those 54 pesticides. Um, and it was not a financial settlement. Then, of course, part of the stuff that I left out is that as those um, reviews and the consultations have taken place in the 23 years since then, the National Marine Fishery Service has been sued and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been sued and they have, in fact, also been sued by pesticide companies, right? So the initial suits are by environmental groups, but now the National Marine Fishery Service has been sued by Dow and Resilience and they've been sued by Kaminova. And this back and forth about the permafrost um, was related to also chemical companies to, to get that product back in use. And so all, but a lot of time it's about like getting the product re reviewed or getting a rule overturned rather than a financial settlement. Yeah. I have like 18 settlement agreements open on my computer right now. <laughs> More questions? Litigation? Legislation? No further questions. <laughs> Can I actually ask one like target question? Thanks. Which was who came up with the BLT comparison? Because that was really good. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Chris did, did message me immediately when he came up with it. That's so awesome. <laughs> Will be the best thing I do all year. <laughs> <laughs> We're all going to use it in all of our talks from now on. Although I have, I have an Easter egg. Do you want to see the Easter egg in the talk? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, this is like the last slide. You just get past questions. Okay. Yeah, we just got some stairs. Yeah. yeah. So this. <laughs> <laughs> this I was at dinner on Saturday night with my ten year old, and she drew this. And what's happening is that these creatures are shooting each other with anger darts. The darts make them angry. They all have weapons. And I said, "Hey, that looks just like the pesticide registration review process. <laughs> Can I use that in my talk?" 
And she says, sure. So I was like, these eight different guys here, they've got maces and lime stars, and some of them have chains on, I think. And um, my understanding from giving talks about this is that's often how people feel after you talk about the blessings and the best letter registration review process and bulletins like that too. It's like you've been shot with an anger dart and now you just want to run around with a lime star. So that's my funny slide, but it's not as good as that's pretty good. Yes. Yeah. Give credit to the artist. Yes. Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> you know this. Well, this is what I was saying. Yeah. There have been some iterations. We took them out for a time, but they were initially after the. So, Santa Net was actually the 2014 lawsuit. We had gotten confused because we thought it was with the Sam. So, there was a website. Oh, this is extra funny too. So in 2001, after the first lawsuit, that language, like there was this mandatory no trade offer from the city for pesticides. It was top secret. It was not on the label. There was like a point of sale poster that people had to point put up, but there was no, and like we had a web page. So you guys did put a web page on it. That was the only way that people would know. And then in 2014, when that no trade offer came back, EPA had a website called Salmon Mapper, and you could go and see like where the areas we needed to have this no strike buffer work. And then for a long time, EPA was saying, we're going to upgrade from Salmon Mapper to Bulletin 5. And then somehow, what we got was an upgrade to Bulletin 5 too. So nobody knows where it went. <laughs> but you can still look at Salmon Mapper if you want to. You can Google up Salmon Mapper. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time.